things are happening around here. Strange, naked indie rock things. Let me try and figure out what the hell I'm doing. Give, give me a second. I, I need to get my story straight. Okay, about a year ago, I remember saying that the pop charts were taking a turn for the better, as evidenced by the unexpected success of Adele, CeeLo Green, Lupe Fiasco, but their hits weren't that strange. They'd all had pop hits before. I had a lot more trouble understanding the sudden success of Foss with the People, but the more pumped up kicks got played, the more it seemed to fit right in, and after a while they didn't sound out of place at all. But then, a couple of months ago, Billboard got taken over by two indie rock songs that stubbornly refused to make sense within the pop landscape as I understand it. And for months now, it's been those two songs topping the charts, We Are Young at number one, and Somebody That I Used To Know at number two, or vice versa. Understand, the only rock songs to reach the top of the charts in the past, like, four and a half years are Viva La Vida by Coldplay and Moves Like Jagger by Maroon 5. And really, I wouldn't even call those rock songs. On top of that, as someone who spent most of his energy in the past three years thinking about Rihanna, I'm a little stymied by having this whole other genre invade my space. It's like if I was a person who read a lot of horror novels and worked really hard to understand horror novels and how they work and tried hard to be one of the best horror novel reviewers around, and then you came up to me and said, here now, Review this brand of toothpaste. But you know what? Fine. Today, I'm gonna force myself to be the best damn toothpaste reviewer I can be. Because one of these songs going to number one, that's a fluke. Both of them going to number one, that's a coincidence. But both of them going number one back to back, that's a trend. So I'm reviewing these two not because I want to or because I have any idea how, but because if this is the direction the pop charts are going in and this is the stuff I'm going to be handed to review from now on, well, I'd better start getting used to it now. <sighs> okay. So, we have two acts here. One, a New York-based indie rock band whose name is ungoogleable, and the other, a Belgian-born Australian man whose name is unpronounceable. I'll level you, I may have disliked fun right from the get-go just for their hipster ironic name, which comes complete with lack of proper capitalization and blunt period at the end for maximum irony. If they were any more hipster, their logo would be upside down, or maybe they'd have a the in the middle of their name. And go to ya. Well, that's not a word, damn it. I wouldn't be surprised if this guy picked his stage name by slamming his fist down on his computer keyboard and reading the results. <laughs> Jokes. Totally not stalling here. Okay. Let's start with, um. Well, for one, where the hell did these people come from? I understand with all the club music that oversaturated the market, something was gonna replace it, but why these guys? Why were they the ones that broke through the pop charts rock barrier and not, say, bands that already had chart success like Linkin Park or, God forbid, Nickelback or even the Neon Trees? Or for that matter, why not some newer act with mountains of buzz like M83 or the Black Keys? I mean, Florence and the Machine have had like three years of hype and she can't get her newest single higher than the mid 70s and a naked Australian goes to number one? And it's not like I don't try to keep my ear to the ground, I just was really taken by surprise that the indie breakthrough came from Fun featuring Janelle Monae and Gotia featuring Kimbra. Of those four acts I just listed, I had heard of exactly one of them before these songs got big, and I'm not actually certain she's on the track at all. Oh, that part's her? That little part? That counts? I didn't even recognize her. I didn't even recognize that I was even a different person singing. What, that three seconds got her a featuring credit? Oh, by the way, guys, you didn't know this, but this video is actually a crossover with, uh, Juorio. Look! Hi. Woo! Best crossover ever. So great to collaborate with you, J-Dub. Okay, for real. I'm on that song almost as long as Janelle Monae is, so that wasn't what made it popular. But it was a rhetorical question anyway. I can tell you right now where these songs came from. Yes, Glee. Just a small town girl. Okay, I don't really watch Glee. I think it promotes the unfair stereotype that gay people make horrible television shows. I mean, I tried. I tried watching it, but... So here's what you missed on Glee. Sue's pregnant, which is crazy. She won't say who the father is, but insists that he's famous. New Directions beat Sebastian and the Warblers, and Sebastian made up with Blaine after realized life's too short to blind people with rock salt. Quinn thought Rachel and Finn were too young to get married and refused to go to the wedding, but then changed her mind and started texting while she raced to the courthouse and her car got hit by a truck. And that's what you missed on Glee. No. No. But I think we need to understand Glee's importance here anyway. 
Glee began Fun's push to number one by covering the song way before anyone even heard of it. And while it did not start Gautier's chart climb, it definitely finished it because their cover is what pushed him over the top. And even with the glut of music talent shows we have right now, there is really no other force on television that has the power to influence our pop charts like Glee does. What I am saying is, Glee is our MTV. Let me repeat that. Glee is now our MTV. Yep. Okay, so to be fair, neither of these acts came totally from nowhere. Fun is a band that's been around for a few years. They opened for Paramore a few years ago, and they're on Fueled by Ramen, the record label that brought you Panic at the Disco, Fall Out Boy, Cobra Starship, Gym Class Heroes, basically every rock band with any pop success in the past five or six years. And Goatee, well, he's been building up buzz in his home country for a while. Still, both of these songs are pretty safely outside the mainstream. We Are Young has these rambling verses, unrelated chorus, and out of nowhere tempo change. For pop music, it may as well be a seven part avant garde opera played on the bagpipes. And this other one, Somebody That I Used to Know by Gotaya? Maybe Peter Gabriel or the Psychedelic Furs could have got something like this on the radio back in the mid 80s, but for me, it's immediately different from anything I've ever heard on the radio in my lifetime. Listen to that weird instrumentation, that high ghostly wail of a voice. I don't often hear pop songs that sound like a lost song from the Corpse Bride soundtrack. Like how did this get big? Maybe people mistook this Kimbra person for Katy Perry? I mean, lots of people seem to be trying to rip off her. Looking at you, Jesse J. But otherwise, I mean, does this sound like anything else? Like what even is that, a xylophone? A marimba, maybe? Maybe that's a Kimbra. But another part of what makes these two songs such a shock is their more literate, more detail-oriented approach to songwriting. Most pop songs are, you know, pop songs. They're, they're love songs full of lovey-dovey cliches and stuff like that. You're just not gonna ever hear Chris Brown write anything as writerly and thoughtful as these two songs. Now take We Are Young. It's just full of interesting lyrical details about... about... Actually, I just realized I have no idea what this song is actually about. From the giant fist-pumping chorus, you'd think that We Are Young is a song about being young and conquering the world, drinking all night, all that fun stuff, but it's a definitely a kind of fun that comes in lowercase with a period after it. I honestly can't tell where they were going with this. Give me a second, I, I need to get my story straight, my friend. But he never really does get his story straight. And there are a lot of things going on here, but it never really coalesces into anything for me. Let me try and put it together. See, I understand that he's at some New York hipster bar. My friends are in the bathroom getting higher than the Empire State. My His friends are doing a lot of drugs. My seat's been taken by some sunglasses asking about a scar and I know I gave it to you months ago. Okay, so he gave her a scar. Emotional? Physical? Well, I'm gonna guess emotional. If it was a literal scar, I doubt some hipster wearing sunglasses inside at night could see it. Well, he's definitely sorry about it, whatever he did. How this all figures into burning brighter than the sun and setting the world on fire, I don't know. He seems to want something from this woman, but I have no idea what. I know that I'm not Where is this going? It's like he was trying to write a completely different song, but then his drunk high friends came back and were too distracting, so he wrote a song about getting shit faced instead. So if by the time the bar closes and you feel like falling down, I'll carry you home tonight. Okay, well, what if the bar doesn't close? What if she leaves before then? What if she's perfectly capable of taking herself home at the end of the night? What's your apology good for then, huh? Now what's your song gonna be about? I mean, it's a nice gesture, but not much of one, really, although I guess it works out for him. I found to carry me home. But I just don't get this song. It's, it's kind of a partying song, it's kind of a breakup slash apology song, but mostly it's not either of those things. As a love song, it's unfocused and frustrating. As a party song, it's dull. It's like a spork, you know? Two things combined together thoughtlessly into one ineffective, half-functional thing you don't know what you're supposed to do with. I don't hate this song, but I just don't have any emotional clarity about how I'm supposed to respond to it, and in the end, I guess I decided to respond with nothing at all. The song doesn't really do anything for me. Sorry. Just doesn't.
We Are Young is full of interesting lyrics, but it's muddled and confused. The picture painted by somebody that I used to know, on the other hand, is not confused. In fact, it's quite devastatingly precise. I suspect that We Are Young, with all its mumbled, jumbled half-apologies, might be about a douchebag. Somebody that I used to know is different, though, because it's definitely about a douchebag. Not by a douchebag, but definitely about one. At the beginning, this song starts as just general post-breakup sadness. Told myself that you were right for me, but felt so lonely in your company. But somewhere along the way, it becomes pretty clear that the narrator is, uh, kind of a whiny dick. Here, let me sum it up for you. Breaking up with you really sucks and I'm really sad. Not that I miss you or anything, but remember how you said you love me? Not that I miss you because I definitely don't. It's just, you're really mean to me now. You're just a really mean person, but I don't need you anyway. You don't mean anything to me anymore, so whatever. want to talk to you anymore? After the breakup she treats you like a stranger? Oh my god, that's common! Come on dude, have you never had a breakup before in your life? I mean, even if I bought that your ex's behavior was above and beyond normal breakup awkwardness, I suspect the problem is not her. Not picking up her stuff in person, like, I, I, I guess that's kind of bitchy, but people don't generally change their numbers out of spite. They change their numbers because their exes won't stop calling them with passive-aggressive bullshit. Just saying. So yeah, like I said, dude sounds like a dick. But I'm pretty sure that's deliberate. If the song had stayed on this level, it might have turned out a little insufferable. But then the song takes a turn for the awesome by having the girl in the scenario walk in and give him a nice lyrical punch in the balls. Oh yes, the contrast is exquisite. See, Goatsy here is all euphemisms and innuendo and guilt tripping, and then Kimbra comes in and just cuts right through the bullshit. So when we found them, we could not make sense. Well, you said that we would still be friends. Yeah, why was it we didn't make sense? All the times you screwed me over. Oh right, yes, that. You said that you could let Oh yeah, that's satisfying. Matter of fact, the fact that he gets dressed down so thoroughly actually makes the guy more sympathetic. Yeah, I'd be wailing in pain too, buddy. Ouch. I do like the song a lot, but honestly, I also feel a little distant from it. Maybe the build-up is a little too slow, it doesn't really kick in for me until the second chorus. It's just not a song that hits me right in the gut, you know? It might make my top 10 this year, it might not. Hmm, you know, I still don't feel like I've done enough here. Maybe I just need to listen to more songs from these two acts before I come to a conclusion. Okay, I just took my crash course in all things fun and Gautier. These guys better not turn out to be flashes in the pan or I've just wasted a lot of time. Well anyway, I've listened to a lot of fun songs now, and now that I've gotten to sample a larger segment of the work, I can say this definitively. These guys have listened to a lot of Queen. Why you wanna stay? Oh my god! Like a whole lot of Queen. The other thing I've discovered is that lead singer Nate Ruiz is not Freddie Mercury. At least not on their biggest song. I think that may be why it doesn't really work for me. Of all the fun songs I listened to, We Are Young felt the least Queen like, especially in the vocals. Nate could have definitely stood to sing this with a little more pomp and circumstance, you know? Without it, We Are Young just ends up sounding lumbering and slow musically. It's basically just a Coldplay song on steroids. Then again, I suppose there are worse ways to sing it. Give me a second eye, I need to get my story straight, my friends are... <sighs> and Gautier? Well, I can tell you that all his videos look like slightly happier versions of Tool videos. And for another thing, this guy is really good. In fact, honestly, I like somebody that I used to know a lot, but I think I like all his other singles even more, especially Eyes Wide Open. And while we're at it, I really like all the other fun songs I listen to too, so 
I guess my final verdict is mixed to positive on their big hits, but it's definitely a big thumbs up for both of them as a whole. I'm, I'm glad they're here to mix things up. Not only do they not sound like stuff that gets popular, it sounds like they weren't trying to be popular. They don't sound like anything else out there. They, they don't even sound like each other, really. And what this definitely signals is that people are hungering for something more. They want better than what the pop charts provide. What we are seeing now is the dawn of a new age, where people demand more thought, more feeling, more depth in their music. Everything changes now. Or not. Look, change doesn't happen overnight, people. What do you want from me? It's a feeling you get when your brain finally lets your heart get in its pants. Glee! 